Hey everybody, welcome to McLean Church Online. My name is Chris Norris. I'm the online site pastor. Many of you know me, but if you don't, if this is your very first time here, I want to welcome you to our online services. We are part of McLean Church. We meet uh, in several locations throughout the northwestern Pennsylvania region. Union City and Edinburgh are our physical locations, but you are tuning in today at McLean Church Online. Some of you are listening on the radio. We welcome those folks. And also those that are watching afterwards on YouTube, uh, welcome. Welcome. Make sure you comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know how your Christmas is going, what kind of shopping you've got left to do. It's a crazy time of year, but may we be reminded of what God reminds us of this magical time of year. Well, can you believe we're one week away? One week from our Christmas Eve celebration. Uh, we can't stress this enough. I know we're beating you over the hedge with it, but please make plans to join us on Christmas Eve at any of our physical or uh, online location here. Service times, locations, everything you need to know uh, is available on our website at mcleanchurch.org slash Christmas. Throw that link in an email, post it to your social media, spread the word, bring friends and family. And if you're joining us here online, I'm looking forward to spending time with you as well. I know that a lot of people are traveling this time of year. Um, maybe you're just really busy getting the house ready for a family coming in. It's an exciting time and I understand that not everyone's able to get to church but that's why we exist right here at McLean Church Online. So you can throw us on your smart TV, crank up the volume, worship and celebrate together right here at McLean Church Online. For those of you that join us regularly for that service, can't wait to spend Christmas with you as always. Well, we've got a great service ahead, of course, so I can't wait to kick things off. Pastor Brian Kelly is going to talk about our next Christmas tradition and how it connects our hearts with the heart of Jesus. And I'm excited to hear from him. But before that, Let's kick things over to the worship team. Hello, church family. My name is Jillian, and I am so excited that you chose during this busy Advent season to worship with us. Hail, hail to the newborn King. Let our voices sing Him our praises. brought us tonight to our Savior. so bright to the knowing light of the stable feel close to the child so dear cast aside your fear and be thankful hail hail to the newborn king let our voices sing him our praises hail hail to the guiding light that brought us to
The last few weeks, we've been discussing Advent, talking about how it's a Latin word meaning the coming and that the modern English definition is the arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. Well, the process of waiting for something to arrive can often be challenging, sometimes even excruciating. So now please take a moment to remember a time when you were waiting for something. In a world with so much instant gratification, it can be difficult to wait for anything. Most of us probably aren't the best at waiting patiently, but the reality is things take the time they take. So this Advent season, remember that joy can be found in the waiting and anticipation. And most importantly, may we all remember that Jesus was and is worth the wait.
this year, we're finally going to get Christmas right. If it's not Jesus, it's got to go. But would that really get us to focus on the reason for the season? We might find it easy to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The point of Jesus' birth was to bring God into humanity. What if we were able to see Jesus in all the traditions? The first Christmas was about God with us. Let's make this Christmas about us with God. Because when we see Jesus, we're getting Christmas right. Well, hello, McLean Church Online. It is great to have you joining us for this service as we move through the season of Advent. And uh, no matter where you're viewing this from or when you're viewing it, uh, you are such an important part of our McLean Church community, and what you're doing right now is so important. Uh, you're being intentional about your spirituality. You're being intentional about this season of Advent. That's so important that we don't let moments like this just quickly pass, but that we think intentionally about them, their meaning, and our response to them. Uh, thanks for doing that with us today. We're in a short series called The Traditions of Christmas, uh, looking at some traditions that don't necessarily have Christian or biblical roots, uh, but which Christians have used throughout the ages uh, to help remind us of the significance of this moment in time, of this time of the year. Uh, you know, there's uh, always around the Christmas season a movement by uh, I think, I think well-meaning uh, Christians to suggest that we should dispense uh, with many of the traditions that don't have specifically biblical origins or, or Christian origins uh, in, in order to get back to the, the true meaning of Christmas. Uh, in, in this series, I'm arguing just the opposite. Um, the Christian faith has always uh, liberally adopted traditions uh, from various places to help communicate the reality of Christ and of God's work in the world. And as we're going to see today, as we talk about two, um, two probably of the most central traditions of the Christmas season, the Christmas tree and Santa Claus, uh, we're going to see how, how the Christian faith very powerfully has used these traditions to communicate important truths uh, about Christ. Uh, it will be interesting for you to note uh, as we look at these two traditions in particular, but really, uh, as we saw last week, as we think about traditions even like the manger scene, um, many of the traditions that we think have always been in place uh, are relatively new. Uh, we'll see today that the tradition of the, of the Christmas tree and of uh, Santa Claus uh, being talked about and, and, and venerated at the level he is today, uh, these are traditions that are really, at, at the most, about 200 years old. Uh, so, so they're pretty new uh, in, the, uh, in human history. It'll be fun to see them unfold today. So what I want to do uh, is give you a, a lot of background to both the Christmas tree and Santa Claus. And then we're going to talk about how these traditions very powerfully help us understand the mysteries of the Christmas season. Because as we said last week, this is what traditions do for us. They help us understand mystery. They make the complex simple. They take realities that are beyond uh, the, the human mind's ability to make sense of, and they make sense of those realities in concrete and graspable ways. And I think the Christmas tree and Santa Claus, uh, they both do that. Just a few words uh, uh, about the things I'm gonna share uh, today. Uh, 
so much of the information we have about traditions, like the ones we're going to speak about, um, so much comes to us from legend, it comes to us from, from oral tradition. Um, primary sources are sometimes difficult to track down and locate. I'm going to do my best uh, to represent to you what, what sort of the consensus of thinking is about the origins of some of these traditions, uh, but please understand uh, what I'm going to say today has not been academically reviewed or, or empirically verified at every point, so you may find information out there uh, that is somewhat different than what we're going to share today, but, but here's uh, the uh, consensus of thinking about the origin of the Christmas tree practice. Uh, we think it dates back to the Middle Ages, uh, particularly to the region of Scandinavia, which if you think of Scandinavia being um, uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, uh, those northern European cold, sparse climates, um, notable in the Middle Ages for, for the presence of, of the Vikings. Uh, we think the origin of the Christmas tree practice goes back to that region and to those people, and it makes sense as you think about how it evolves. Um, in these very cold, desolate winter climates, wintertime was a season of, of darkness and death. Um, a lot of people died in these climates over the winter time. Uh, the world was a very dark place and all creation seemed to speak of death. Again, think about um, in the early Middle Ages when scientific understanding is extremely limited. What you know is that when the snow comes, all the trees that, that are lovely green and lush for a few months of the year all of them seem to die. Die just like some of your animals do that don't survive the winter, like some of the elderly people in your village who can't survive the winter. Death seems to reign in this climate of cold and darkness. And yet, strangely, there is one tree that seemingly does not die. <laughs> There's one tree that stays green all year long. Now, of course, we, in our present day scientific understanding, uh, we understand that, that all of the trees that, that go dormant or lose their leaves are still very much alive, but in the early Middle Ages, you don't know this. You just know that everything seems to die, all the trees seem to die, but there is one type of tree that doesn't die. It stays green. It stays alive. And it seems there is evidence from this early medieval period of time that uh, people of this region began to bring evergreen trees into their homes. Again, uh, we know in this culture they're, they're, they're um, we would say highly superstitious. They, 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 they see the gods working in and through and behind everything, uh, which may not be a crazy idea. And by bringing the evergreen into their home, there's a sense that they're bringing the force of life, that there's bringing this, they're bringing a source of health, they're bringing a source of vitality uh, into their home in a season that is so dark and depressing. Saint Boniface in the seventh century, uh, so the 600s, seems to pick up on some of this practice. And he begins to talk about the evergreen tree uh, as representing the tree of life uh, because the evergreen never dies. And he further points out that the uh, triangular shape of the evergreen tree uh, represents or symbolizes the Trinity. And we start to see uh, seemingly people throughout Europe during this period of time beginning to use the evergreen tree again as a reminder of a source of life in the winter 
as a reminder of a spiritual source of life, perhaps even as a reminder of the Trinity. We have an interesting development in the Baltic region. And again, this is all during the Middle Ages. So, so when we think of the, the Middle Ages, you know, think, think, think roughly um, uh, the period of, uh, of 500 to, to, to 1200, to use a, a, really, um, a, a really generalized span of time. In the Baltic region, the practice develops of bringing an evergreen tree into the church and referring to it as a paradise tree. And it's reported that um, they would hang apples on the paradise tree and invite children around it to act out the creation story, particularly the story of the fall. Uh, with, with certain children playing the part of Adam and Eve, a child playing the part of a serpent, Adam and Eve would be uh, coerced to take an apple from the tree and eat it, and then by, they'd be chased by the other children around the tree and out of the church as a way in a period when people couldn't read uh, of acting out uh, what happens in the fall story. So again, from the Scandinavian period in the early Middle Ages uh, through Boniface, uh, through this practice in the Baltic region of using an evergreen as a paradise tree, you begin to get this focus on, on evergreens as communicating some important spiritual truths. It's not though until Luther, Martin Luther, the famous Protestant reformer in the 16th century, uh, that, that the practice of using the evergreen at Christmas time really starts to gain traction. Uh, it's reported, again, uh, may just be legend, uh, that one December evening, uh, Luther is walking home and he notices how the starlight uniquely filters through the boughs on the evergreens. And apparently he has an evergreen tree in his home, maybe going back to this, this early Scandinavian Viking tradition. And he goes home and he puts candles on the tree, uh, not an advisable practice, but he puts candles on the tree to emulate the starlight that he saw filtering through the trees on his walk home. Apparently this tradition catches on in Germany and you have the beginning of putting lights on the Christmas tree. And Luther will point out that the tree really reflects the love of God, which never ends or does not die. The tree stays green, the love of God stays alive and vibrant. And he talked about the candles on the tree representing the light of God in the world, or specifically uh, the, the, the light of Christ that is brought into the world at Christmas time. This practice of using an evergreen tree around Christmas, it comes to the United States in a particularly unusual way during the American Revolution. Uh, Hessian mercenaries, uh, again from Germany, apparently bring this practice uh, to the colonies, to the newly formed United States, um, but it doesn't last. It doesn't catch on. So again, if you think about the early uh, 1800s, uh, essentially nobody in uh, America is putting a Christmas tree up in their home. And this is, again, only a couple hundred years ago. In the 1820s, though, German immigrants in, guess what, Pennsylvania, are noted as bringing this practice with them from Germany. Again, this is where Luther is from bringing the practice of Christmas trees with them uh, to the United States and beginning to practice this tradition in Pennsylvania. But still, the tradition doesn't catch on in a big way across the United States. It takes a, um, a world-shaping movement or moment to make this happen, and that comes in 1841 when the German Prince Albert marries Queen Victoria of England. Germans Prince Albert marries Queen Victoria of England and guess what they put up for Christmas in Windsor Castle? A Christmas tree. As so many of our American traditions around Christmas, 
go back to the Victorian era of the 1800s, this is where the Christmas tree really gets its launch in its present day because if Queen Victoria has a tree in the castle, uh, we should certainly have a tree in our home. And it seems from this, uh, what we would call the antebellum period of American history, putting up Christmas trees seems to take off in this moment. Um, so much so that in 1851, a very enterprising businessman brings the first trees into New York City for commercial sale. 1851, he sets up the first Christmas tree lot because again, most of the country can go out, uh, go out on their property or in the surrounding woods and harvest a Christmas tree. As the tradition takes off, urban areas are challenged with that. 1851, the first Christmas tree lot. And then in the 1880s, there's concern that the Christmas tree thing is such a big phenomena. There's concern in the country uh, that, that the evergreens are going to be eliminated. So guess what happens? Someone creates the artificial Christmas tree. And in the late 1800s, uh, we have the beginning of, of the debate between artificial or real Christmas trees. So, so again, in the Christmas tradition that, that exists now from, from the mid-1800s, uh, to the present day in the form that most of us experience it. You have a tradition that really goes back to the early mid Middle Ages, Scandinavian culture, recognizing, oh, there's something unique in creation. In the midst of death, there is life. In the midst of darkness, by Luther's practice, there's light. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Let's switch focus to Santa Claus. Uh, the person of Santa Claus uh, really has quite a clear point of origin and a, a, a very clear development of its history that's probably a little more easily traceable than the Christmas tree. The person of Santa Claus clearly goes back to the person of Saint Nicholas in the fourth century fourth century of what would now be uh, the region of Turkey. And you can find lots of information, biographical information, legendary information about Saint Nicholas. He becomes a saint who is uh, prolifically uh, written about uh, throughout history. So um, go online, you can read uh, all that you want and more uh, about this character. But here, here's the essence of his story. Uh, St. Nicholas, born in the 4th century, um, uh, present-day Turkey, he's born to very wealthy parents. Um, uh, his parents uh, die, and St. Nicholas, at a very young age, um, chooses to give the family fortune away to the needy in his community. Um, again, this is... Um, fourth century, the 300s. This kind of act is a bit unusual because you don't have a lot of movement between the classes. Uh, Nicholas is born into a very wealthy uh, aristocratic class. Um, you don't have a lot of regard for the lower classes. Uh, there's a sense that you um, Everyone just lives happily in the lot or the class that they were assigned to at birth. And of course, this was a theme that Jesus challenged his followers with regularly. Nicholas seems to get that message. And again, he chooses upon the passing of his parents to, to distribute his family's wealth to the needy in his community. And it's no doubt spurred... Um, by, by, by a, a, a spiritual devotion, a devotion to Christ, because at 17, uh, Nicholas becomes a monk. He will later become a priest. He'll later become a bishop. And um, both legend and history uh, tell us that he is, he's just a great guy. Um, he's, he's, he's a good leader. Um, he, he's, a, he's a wise uh, cleric. Uh, he's generous. 
as is evidenced from this first act of giving his family's wealth away. And Nicholas dies on December 6th. This is an important date. On December 6th, we're not sure what year. Um, most history tradition has it somewhere around the year 350. So A.D. 350 or 350 uh, um, C.E., Nicholas dies on December 6th. And it seems that he is almost immediately venerated uh, by people across Europe. In fact, an early tradition develops on the, um, on the day of his death uh, that children would set out food for him in their house if he chose to visit. Because again, um, in the Middle Ages, there's... Uh, Maybe, maybe in a healthy way, there, there's less of a sense of a barrier between this world and the next world, between uh, the temporal and the eternal, between the, the, the present and future realities. Those, those barriers are, are, are much more thin as we saw in our study of Celtic Christianity. And uh, so this tradition develops of children setting out food for St. Nicholas and hay for his donkey. Uh, on the evening of the anniversary of his death. And those uh, foods and hay would be replaced in the morning for the children with gifts. See some of the practices of present day Christmas uh, sneaking in, again, very early Middle Ages. Uh, there's no doubt that there's another influence on the, the St. Nicholas or the Santa Claus tradition uh, it's not as strong as St. Nicholas, uh, but it certainly fits into the tradition. It's, it's King Wenceslaus, uh, good King Wenceslaus. Uh, Wenceslaus is um, a 10th century um, uh, uh, duke, actually, of, um, of a, a region of Bohemia. And uh, he has a very short life. <clears throat> he only lives 22 years. Uh, he's actually murdered by his brother who, who wants uh, to ascend uh, to, to his, his position of, of rulership. Uh, but Wenceslaus is reported that uh, on the feast of St. Nicholas, um, he, would, he would give out gifts to the needy of his region. He again was known as being very generous. And at the same time that Wenceslaus lives and he's beginning to be talked about across Europe, um, the deeds of St. Nicholas, which now are, we're talking, we're, we're in the 10th century now, we're, we're 700 years from, from Nicholas, they begin to be written about and recorded, uh, particularly uh, by a man named uh, Simeon, uh, often called Simeon Metaphastes, um, and uh, his, his, his title, uh, uh, it's Simeon the Metaphastist, actually, which is, uh, Metaphastist is a, a word which means literal translation. Uh, Simeon was translating a lot of the writings and the works of St. Nicholas into um, 10th century European culture. So Nicholas is being read about at this time. Um, you have this tradition growing around Wenceslaus, uh, in, in, in Bohemia, and then you have an interesting thing happen. Nicholas is being venerated on the day of his death, often as we saw with, with, with gift giving, December 6th. But then the Protestant Reformation happens. And with the Reformation, there was a strong movement against anything to do with the, the Catholic tradition of venerating saints. So it seems that what begins to happen is many of the practices around the veneration of Nicholas on the day of his death, December 6th, begin to be merged with the Christian celebration of Christ's birth on December 25th. So you see uh, this movement from December 6th, St. Nicholas, to December 25th. 
seemingly fueled by the Reformation's emphasis across Europe that we're not supposed to venerate saints anymore, so we begin to move some of this practice to Christmas Day. Now, this continues to be interesting, so stay with me. When the Puritans come to America in the 17th century, so this is just, this is, this is 100 years after the Reformation, uh, they're some of the early proponents of dispensing with all these additional traditions around Christmas. In fact, um, they prohibit their people from mentioning St. Nicholas. Um, there is no gift giving, singing of carols, or lighting of candles allowed during the Christmas season, during the celebration of Christmas Day. And the Puritans believed that they were trying to recapture the real spirit of Christmas, and admittedly, to their credit, it seems like the celebration of this holiday in Europe, maybe in England, particularly where the Puritans come from, had become filled with quite a bit of debauchery. It was just a, a, a big party. Think about um, uh, uh, a Mardi Gras in cultures around the world today, which is a, 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 a spiritually rooted holiday, which has just become an occasion for, for, for partying. Seems that maybe this is what has happened with Christmas in England. The Puritans are trying to correct that. So well, when the Puritans come to America, there's sort of an anti-Christmas celebration move. And that seems to persist until the end of the 18th century, until the late 1700s. Guess what? In the late 1700s, what we have is we have examples in newspapers of St. Nicholas being mentioned and the traditions around him, the legends around him, the stories around him beginning to be revived. In 1800, the New York Historical Society chooses to adopt St. Nicholas as their patron saint. And it's reported that there was gift giving associated with this decision the reestablishment of some of the veneration and the traditions surrounding St. Nicholas are brought back by presumably a largely Dutch community that makes up the New York Historical Society. Now, if you've kind of been tuned out up until this point, really dial in now because this is where it gets, where it gets fascinating. The Dutch pronunciation or uh, the Dutch verbalization of St. Nicholas is Sinterklaas, Sinterklaas. And I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that uh, with, with the appropriate Dutch accent, but bear with me. When the Dutch talk about uh, St. Nicholas, they use the word Sinterklaas. You can see how quickly non-Dutch speaking people surrounding these Dutch communities would have coined the term Santa Claus. And hence, St. Nicholas becomes Santa Claus in popular lore. Now, stay with me for just a minute. In 1808, Washington Irving, who you'll remember um, writes uh, Legends from Sleepy Hollow, uh, Washington, and Ir Washington Irving uh, writes a story about Santa Claus, uh, which sounds somewhat similar to our present understanding of Santa Claus. And then 14 years later, this is where it all starts to come together. Clement Clark Moore. You remember what work he's the author of? Twas the night 
before Christmas. 1822, Clement Clark Moore writes this fictional work. He doesn't even want to be uh, uh, named for it originally. That describes St. Nick in terms of our, our present day understanding of Santa and his sleigh uh, bringing gifts coming down the chimney. And Moore does something very interesting in his story that we might not catch without this background. Moore moves the veneration of St. Nicholas because remember his story says, I knew in an instant it must be who? St. Nick, Santa Claus, Santa Claus. But he moves the celebration or the veneration of St. Nicholas or Santa Claus or Santa Claus from December 6th to when? It was the night before Christmas. He moves the celebration from December 6th to Christmas Eve. And, and Moore's story, Moore's, Moore's poem is, is maybe solely responsible uh, for the movement of the celebration of Santa Claus around the celebration of Christmas. In 1863, it gets even better. An artist named Thomas Nast, who's, who's pretty famous, uh, he's the one who gave us the... Um, the donkey and the elephant as the symbol, uh, symbols of America's two political parties. 1863, uh, Nast uh, writes for, the, uh, for Harper's Weekly, writes for them for almost 30 years, or illustrates for them for almost 30 years. He illustrates Moore's poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas. And with his illustrations, we begin to get a visualization of Santa Claus, sort of the jolly old elf. And here's the fascinating thing. Uh, um, Nast will depict Santa Claus as one of the 19th century, you've heard them called robber barons, uh, the, 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 the industrialists who got so wealthy uh, during the late 19th century. And Nast is, he's making a social commentary by how he picks, depicts Santa Claus. He says, you know, you, you, the robber barons, you need to, you, you look like Santa Claus, you need to act more like Santa Claus. Throughout the late 19th century, um, Nast will continue to illustrate Santa in the Harper's Weekly. And so the proliferation of this visualization of our present day Santa Claus happens. And then comes 1897. Uh, the year that maybe changes everything. A little eight-year-old girl in third grade, Virginia O'Hanlon, writes to the New York Sun asking the question, does Santa exist? And of course, we all know what happened. Uh, Francis Church uh, one of the editors of The Sun uh, writes his famous response uh, with the catching line, he asks Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Uh, Church's uh, editorial response back to, to, to little Virginia uh, will be run for years uh, by The Sun um, uh, at Christmas time. And... Uh, if you've never read it, you certainly need to. In 1931, uh, another artist, Haddon Sunblum, working as an advertiser for none, none other than Coca-Cola, uh, draws another rendition of Santa uh, picking very much up on Matt Nast's uh, previous uh, drawings and gives us the popularized version in the early Coca-Cola ads that really becomes the Santa that we know today. So 
this tradition that goes through a lot of, lot of changes and, and a lot of, lot of morphing uh, really dates back to this young Christian in 4th century present-day Turkey who chooses to be generous to the people in need around him. The Christmas tree. Life in the midst of death. Um, a simple symbol that people throughout the Middle Ages used to remind them that um, what they saw was not the complete reality, that even in the midst of the worst conditions, the worst suffering, the hardest days, there was life. Seems like a theme that Jesus very much taught. I'm with you always to the end of the age. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. Uh, I'll send you the Comforter. Jesus was constantly reminding his followers that when life seemed dark, when life seemed challenging, mm, he was with them. There was always life. There was always hope. The Christmas tree, light in the darkness. That in the dark, dreary days of winter when it seemed like there was no hope, there was indeed a light. Jesus said, I'm, I'm the light of the world. A pretty important tradition for us to remember. That when all hope seems gone, when direction seems lost, <laughs> Looking at the twinkling lights on your Christmas tree is a reminder that that is not true. The light of Christ is very much present, very much still shining. Santa Claus. A prompting toward generosity. How more clear, simple, or basic could it be that... that, that Joy in life is found in, in giving ourselves away, in giving of our things, in giving of ourself, especially to respond to the needs of others. Uh, this is where life is found. The generosity that pervades the Christmas season, it, it's, it's why we all get excited on Christmas morning, not just to receive, but to give. There's something God has baked into the human nature that wants to give itself away, that doesn't want to be selfish, that doesn't want to be restrictive, that doesn't want to be hoarding. Santa Claus, we, we love Santa Claus because Santa Claus reminds us that there's something deep inside of us that wants to be generous, that wants to give. But you know, I think in the Santa Claus tradition and the story, what Santa Claus is the greatest reminder of is that there are realities in this life and this world that can't be seen, that can't be empirically verified, but which are very, very present. Jesus talked about this with his followers. He talked about the Holy Spirit as, as a force that, that you can't see, but which is real. Jesus talked about his kingdom is a reality that, that you couldn't empirically show on a map, but which was very present. The book of Revelation will use uh, the, the, the most splendid of imagery to talk about realities that one can't see or prove, but which are very present. Santa Claus reminds us that there are things that you can't prove that you can't see, but which are very, very real. And of course, Francis Church, in his response to, 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 to Little Virginia, he made that so very clear. Again, uh, maybe one of the most um, uh, devotional things you could do uh, today is to, 
to, to pull that response uh, up on your computer and read it yourself, read it to your family, read it to your friends as a reminder, oh, there are realities. Jesus talked a lot about them, which I can't see, but which are real. And those realities are a source of inspiration and hope. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And we beheld His glory. Traditions like the Christmas tree, like Santa Claus, they help us embrace that glory. May the reality of this Christmas season fill your heart today and always with the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love that this season embodies. During the Advent season, we celebrate love. One definition of love is seeking the well-being of others and expecting nothing in return. We read about love in the Bible in 1 John 4, a letter of John the Apostle that says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. Thank you for the love that you brought to the world in Jesus Christ. Because of this gift, we know that real love requires sacrifice and selflessness. As we celebrate Advent, may we continue to love one another with love that comes from you. In your name we pray.
with another message that reminds us of the importance of these Christmas traditions and of course prepares our heart for the big day that's coming up Christmas just one week away. Of course, plan to join us for any of our Christmas Eve services. And then the following week, just a friendly reminder that on New Year's Eve, we always take the weekend after Christmas off. So we do not meet in person at any of our physical locations. So if you're planning on coming to church, stay home with your family that day. More than anything, just take time to relax and reflect on the past year. Now we will be offering an online only service that day and it's gonna be a great service. So do plan on tuning in uh, and joining your church family online only next weekend across all of our locations. I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for being with us here at McLean Church Online. I look forward to seeing you on Christmas Eve.